And for those, for those of you who don't uh, know Hebrew, uh, welcome to the second lecture. Uh, as you heard already, today our subject is designing through vision and dream, and more technically, through the use of analogical reasoning. Those who were very disappointed yesterday, I hope will be delighted today. And uh, all probability is that those who were very happy yesterday will be disappointed today. There is no way of gaining this game. I would like to summarize a little bit what we tried to say yesterday. I think the most important point we wanted to make was that analysis does not constrain creativity. And it is possible that encourages it. We try to do that a little bit more analytically, and we try to do it expressively through the marvelous work of Santiago. However, you have to keep in mind that design through analysis can lead also to combinatorial explosion, I will come back to that, or to what technically we call local optimum. In both cases, you arrive at a situation that you don't know what to do. And it is better maybe to proceed through another way. This is exactly what we are going to discuss today. Now, let me also uh, remind you a little bit how the argument was built yesterday, especially through the examples of uh, Santiago. Uh, let me summarize that in three words. We have form, we have performance, and uh, we have operation. In other words, form is how the object is made, and you saw all those configurations and shapes and so on. Performance is what it does to us, what it relates to us. Is it satisfactory? Is it painful? Is it enjoyable? And operation is how it works. That is how form relates, I don't say causes, relates to the working of the object and how the working of the object relates to performance. The other way around, we can look at that in terms of how an object we would like it to perform and as a result, how it should work and as a result, how it should be made. So the examples that Santiago was sketching and carrying us through was traveling through those three levels, showing a form, then explaining how it operates, how it works, talking about the consequences of the performance, and then going back to the form and saying, why shouldn't we do it in a different way? And by doing it in a different way, the working change and the performance changes. This is fundamentally what was discussed. Now comes the thesis, and the thesis says the following. If we would like to achieve a certain performance, and if this relates to a certain operation, what is the form 
that will make it possible. That is, how can we invent the form? And then, through the thesis, it started becoming clear that it is possible, but not always, that maybe we don't invent the form, we discover it. Because designing through measure and number, through, in fact, combinatorics, we might be able to enumerate all possible solutions. And then the problem is simply looking at the constraints, looking at the situation, looking at the performance and operation, and through that, simply going through all the possible solutions and matching, picking up the best. Then, you know, this is roughly, if you remember our uh, landscape, was the idea that here is the optimum, here is the best solution. If we completely enumerate, we go around and exhaustively, we cover everything, and we arrive at that point that we know it is the optimum because whatever we do, whatever changes we make with the form, you go, you affect the operation and you go down in terms of the performance. And then we added that this sounds like very rational. In fact, it is absurd because with very few cases, complete enumeration, the dream of Descartes, the dream of Leibniz, the dream of engineers during the 1950s and the beginning of the 60s is very rarely applicable because of the combinatorial explosion. We'll come back to that. Then we said there is a way through which we can have a shortcut, the famous hill climbing approach. What does it mean? Well, Santiago already demonstrated that to you. You take the form, the existing form, you want to transform. You look, you reflect how it is made, and then you apply a very simple rule. It is not complete enumeration. Why not do the opposite? Now, that's a heuristic. It's a shortcut. In other words, you don't search for all possible solutions. If you know, the bridge can be hanged this way or that way or that way or that way. You simply say, well, instead of supporting, let me go above it. So this is a heuristic. But even this approach, as I mentioned yesterday, is not applicable, especially given the situation where, you know, you have those vicious landscapes which have several tops, and if you are trapped here, you are doomed, as several times we do, insisting that this is the best possible solution, it becomes very much an ego trip, and uh, you forget that the real height, the optimum, is somewhere else. So we said, how can we jump from one peak to another peak? Well. We will examine today a very basic technique we do that, which is applying analogy. Now, we could have done that in a more analytical way and so on. I would like you to give me the permission to use a historical example, not only because it is part of my craft, but also there is an affinity, keeping all proportions, between the person I'm going to talk about, and Santiago. Again, you know, I don't want to flatter you. Uh, I'm going to talk about Leonardo da Vinci. Now, there are some superficial similarities. Don't take it seriously. Leonardo da Vinci was making sculpture, was making architecture, was making painting. 
And uh, Santiago does a little bit of all that. He also <laughs> made bridges. But I will come to a very specific aspect of Da Vinci, which is rather little known. And um, this is the result of a research we did. It's one of our cases on creativity. And it was a very good situation. There was a major European, actually international, confer or not conference. It led to a conference, but it was an international research project on the European fortification. The task which was assigned to me was the invention of the triangulated bastion. Very soon you will see what I mean with that. The first thing that comes to our mind with fortifications are tall towers above, you know, walls. And uh, the classic image is round towers combined with walls. And there was a reason for that. You remember yesterday I talked a little bit about the circle considered as the perfect shape, perfect because of the archaic uh, ideas of divination and astrology and so on, but also perfect because of the Hellenistic mathematics that it used the minimum of periphery, therefore materials and work, for the maximum of containment. There were also some, you know, discussions about the solidity of a round wall, but I won't enter into that. So, anyhow, the perfect fortification was one that, which is made out of those towers, which are tall, and survey the rest of the walls, the rest of the walls, if possible, being also part of a circle. And then from that, you kept on, you know, throwing things on the heads of the people around. Then, all of a sudden, if we cut history, we arrive at the end of 16th century, 17th century, and you have the whole Europe populated with something like that. In fact, this is a very beautiful plan by the famous military engineer, uh, the French military engineer, Vauban. As you can see here, the building, verse here it is high, here it is very low. And what is characteristic of this type of fortification, you have very little actually in Israel, this type of fortification. What is characteristic about it is straight lines. Now, the question which was posed, the research question was how it was invented. Let's go back in this fascinating and depressing history of I can do it better, whatever you do. People, as I mentioned, try to go up, while people from the outside try to become more potent through all kinds of devices, including this very primitive Canon. Those are more imaginative devices, and uh, this is an even more imaginative one, how you can jump in. I can go through catalogs and catalogs of contraptions, how to defeat the height and the might of the walls. Then the canon arrives. And what is interesting about the canon is there are two things that change the situation. Uh, it is more powerful and accurate. And second, it is very, very expensive. Thus, the problem, now we are sophisticated, we are already in the Renaissance, where ideas of optimization are becoming more and more common among those people who are called the engineers. Now, interestingly, the engineers, for the moment, don't make walls. The engineers primarily were interested in those contraptions, those machines, which through movement, the ancestorship of all those uh, roads and joints, 
were throwing things inside. Antidote to the canon, develop something like that. What I mean is the following. What happens, you see, with a canon is, as you have the fortification, you would like to protect all its periphery. So the best way to protect the periphery is to have a tower, again, around for the same reasons, and try through that to protect what goes on around the periphery. However, as you can see, the tower has to be protected as well. So, as you shoot, this area becomes, as you shoot from here, very difficult to cover, to protect. So, let's come back now to the formulation of the problem. How can we design a new kind of object, a new fortification, which has maximal defense, that is, every point is controlled, with a minimum cost, in this specific case, not so much the fortification itself as the guns. The minimum number of this highly expensive device. This is a drawing by Francesco Di Giorgio, and what you can see is the struggle of this man taking out you know, towers in order to defend the walls, but then always ending up into those points which are not defensible. Now, Francesco Di Giorgio is contemporary to Leonardo da Vinci. There are overlaps. Wrote a very interesting dissertation where he tries a little bit like the experiments you made with the bridges to incompletely enumerate. That is, take step by step various possibilities, I won't bother you, through which you take the towers here and here and here. Well, the incomplete enumeration was, I think, about 32, 33 drawings which we have. To the degree that people, historians, said, well, you know, he invented the triangular bastion without any other kind of proof. Now, let's see how we proceed. This is the end product, roughly. What you can see here, as I showed you in the Vauban, there are only straight lines. And uh, you can see all kinds of geometrical nodes here in relation to this plan. And uh, believe me, we don't arrive always to real optima, as I mentioned before, but we approximate. We are doing rather well with this new invention. The new invention is not a shape. It ends up in something which is called triangular bastion. But the important thing is the procedure through which whatever the site, whatever the size, we develop a configuration. Now let's see how things worked out. Precedence, that is, going backwards from the solution to the possible, that is, backtracking to how a person thought about it, is, first of all, somebody must be able to make those straight lines. Well, the precedent to that, as we mentioned before a little bit, is the whole art of geometry. The whole art of geometry is now very sophisticated in relation to land surveillance and in relation, of course, to perspective. So this is a technique which by now we are in Quattrocento. It is really very sophisticated. Here is a drawing by Dürer. You see it deformed perspectively, but you see also something else. There is a shadow. And the shadow is generated by a light which comes from a source. Now we come to another interesting theory that goes on around that time about optics and how we see. And inherited from antiquity, there are two theories. One is 
that you know objects emit something to the eye, but also strange, a very peculiar theory that the eye emits things like projecting our hand and touches the objects, and this is how we see. In other words, the eye has ballistic, it shoots properties. Here is another engraving by Dürer, and you see the result of this ballistic idea that a perspective drawing is nothing but a number of shooting dots on a cutting plane which choose points from one point of view, which is the eye towards the object. Here are some of what has been called doodles, that is, meaningless drawings of Leonardo da Vinci. And in fact, I'm quoting actually quite serious and important historians that called them doodles, because it was very peculiar what actually he was trying to do here. So together with the sections and the other kinds of perspective projection of objects, you have those drawings which are actually studies of how shadows are generated from a source of light. And those studies are next to another kind of drawing, and as you can see immediately, it looks extremely similar, which is a drawing trying to identify the configuration of a fortification. Here, you see the combination of both. Here is a fortification drawing. Here is a drawing that creates some kind of diagram, but perspective, together with shadow drawings all mixed up. And here, even more explicitly, you have the line of shooting traced like the line of perspective. You say, well, you know, what's the big deal? You know, she drew a line. When you shoot, there is a line. Well, this representation, if you look historically at all possible archives we have, it hasn't been attempted by anyone till Leonardo da Vinci started drawing those lines. Not only did he do that first, but he also did it systematically by transferring his knowledge from perspective and shadow drawing. Why shadow drawing is so important? It is important, if you come back to this problem, whereby the area which is not defended under question is like a shadow. So, result. This is a drawing that erroneously has been uh, assigned to Francesco Di Giorgio. I'm not a graphologist, but it is absolutely absurd if you look at the lines that Francesco Di Giorgio did. It looks very much like the lines of Da Vinci, and I guarantee you it is a Da Vinci drawing. And the earliest document we have of this line which has been called the polishing line. So we have another metaphor here, another analogy. In other words, I make the angle of the fortification in such a way as if I polish something that nothing is left uncontrolled, uncovered. Now, this is a fascinating kind of invention. And if we look back, the miracle, because it appears as if it is a miracle, is nothing but an analogical way of moving from a thing we know, in other words, we know has properties, 
Some of the properties have to do with form. Some of the properties have to do with operation. Some of the properties have to do with performance. This is now our unknown. The performance is known. This is what we want it to happen. There are things quasi known about operation and the form is totally unknown. So the whole idea about analogical thinking is based on if two objects have a certain amount of things in common, then other properties will be also common. In other words, we start looking at an existing object as if it was something else. Now, that is invention, but it is also hallucination, dreaming. In fact, the most extreme case of that is schizophrenia. Thus, the whole question, if an artist or a scientist has actually very similar characteristics as the melancholic man, the under mercury of the Renaissance, or even the most pathological person of our time. Now, if you saw this wonderful film, A Beautiful Mind, describes wonderfully how a person who is a combination of both a genius and the person that has problems, projects patterns where the patterns do not exist by creating this kind of matching. So I come now to my uh, conclusion by showing you how in the end those books on fortification looked like and how this is Cataneo, it's the first textbook that describes the method, and how in more elaborate drawings of the beginning of the 17th century, uh, the fortification uh, essays uh, looked like. And now I'm going to finish, and uh, I will not interrupt you unless you take too long, but uh, what I would like to do is uh, try to convince you, as Santiago, I think, will take us through this dream work that is looking at things as if they are something else, and out of that, creating the new. Look at that not only in terms of the power of dream, and the spectacle of dream work, that's a Freudian term actually, but also in terms of the hidden rigor, the hidden system which operates behind it, which however, instead of having this systematic incremental approach of analysis, is saltational. In other words, it performs those incredible jumps. Well, it's very difficult for me to uh, follow uh, uh, up, and particularly I would like just to uh, underline uh, a fact. It is the, uh, indeed by looking uh, personalities like Leonardo from the perspective of today, uh, you could almost think it's impossible that a personality like that has existed uh, and in uh, such a, in a special epoch and coming through so many uh, difficulties. And I think uh, uh, among the many things we should uh, approach uh, uh, or, or try to learn from the work of, of those uh, 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 persons is the, uh, the sense of the sublime and also the enormous discipline they have brought in their life to arrive to draw 
in and to represent and, and to think and have this clarity of, of uh, uh, or this discipline uh, in such a deep uh, uh, way uh, as, as an instrument of work as they has had and at the other side also uh, indeed is this very positive belief of uh, that the observation of the nature is a, a, a great source of uh, of innovation and of inspiration and i would like to show you uh, you know i mean sh some of my work alexander chose this uh, work uh, for uh, the next presentation is a tower we have done in Barcelona. The tower is, it was done for the Olympic Games. It's uh, built mostly in steel and the top is built in a radomized material. It means a material that is transparent to the waves where the antennas are. Here you see some of uh, uh, a view from the bottom. It's supported in three points. It has a triangle in the bottom and a triangle in the top. The center of gravity of the overall load goes in the center of the uh, basis and uh, let's say even if it uh, appears uh, to be almost let's say contradictory in sense of bringing the vertical forces from the top uh, to the bottom but um, you have to think that building a tower of this magnitude and also of this lightness the most important effort is the wind and it doesn't change very much the efforts of the wind if you incline a little bit the tower particularly if you bring the loads into the center of the basis. So there is, uh, uh, I will go also and m make you some sketches. So indeed, the basis is a, is a triangle, as you can see, and the top also. And we are carrying here the systems of the tower supported in these three points with the center of gravity more or less in this in this area, so the resultant works in plan, works uh, as uh, distributing the loads in a regular basis in the three points. As I say, if the tower was vertical, imagine the tower was vertical with uh, the, like a conventional tower, uh, the effort given by the wind in the basis will be, the bending moments will have this shape. By inclining the tower, and preserving the center of gravity of the basis. Practically, the bending moments are the same. So, indeed, there is not a material uh, fact uh, that it is more or less uh, material employed if the tower will be following more or less this shape by doing it purely vertical. Indeed, when you look the tower from the front, the tower itself, who appears laterally inclined, to be inclined, when you look at it from the front, the tower is vertical. So this, what we are seeing here, could be a frontal view of the tower, if we want to distinguish a front. This is an approach. So finally, there is a, a very calm uh, and very precise background, bringing you to the use of the radomized uh, material here on the top, enclosing the antennas, the parabolic ones, and uh, the direction, uh, and, and then the uh, radiating area in the top of the tower. So there is an order who corresponds to the regular approach of uh, a tower. However, what for me was uh, uh, is another way to, to understand the, the tower could be done here if you look the shape of it. So, I, in a way, there is a, There is an anthropomorphical approach uh, as a sign of uh, is the now how far uh, you see is legitimate you see to approach the design 
by uh, learning, for example, from the human body, as I say. In my opinion, so far, the rules of the approximation uh, to the problem are orthodox, and the wind forces are controlled, and the supports are controlled, and the force goes to the center of gravity, and uh, the material is randomized, and indeed all the functional belongings have been satisfied. Uh, I think it's interesting uh, when uh, 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 you as a, uh, get the personal freedom to, uh, mm, to approach the problem also in a personal way and add uh, 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 another value, uh, uh, who is, uh, as I say, uh, uh, the fact that you can project yourself in the work you are doing. By reading uh, uh, an Italian of the 20th century called Matteo Marangoni in a book, uh, uh, Sapervedere, he makes a comparison uh, between three cupolas, uh, the, this of Brunelleschi in uh, Santa Maria del Fiore or St. Peter's Dome of Michelangelo and Santivo alla Sapienza from Borromini. And they are a, a couple of passages in which he say, and you see there that an architect similar to a, a painter or a sculptor, the whole book is speaking mostly about painter, painting, sculpture, a little bit also about music, but can project his uh, idea or his message and touch uh, through the force of the modernature and the chiaroscuro, he say. And indeed, I believe that these uh, patterns are still there. So I mean that you can approach a work and work like in a, in a duplicity in which you have the very uh, uh, rigorous world, uh, world of the engineering which you have to conform those things, make it buildable, make it also financiable and uh, possible. And at the other side, the object can have also in the beginning, in the beginning also a relation with a world who doesn't belong uh, to the world of the everyday, who is uh, an idea who guides you uh, uh, from the beginning and oriented the work in a, certain, in a certain way. Here you see the tower, the support is just a point. This is more uh, a kind of photography in which you come closer by uh, deciding that this is a pregnant point, that this is a very special uh, moment of the way how two materials come together where the support is emphasized. In other cases, for example, you are seeing the City of the Arts and Science in Valencia. It's a project in which I have been, it's in my hometown, has been working already almost, uh, almost 15 years. In this project is a city of uh, museums and you see the Science Museum, the IMAX Theater, and you see also the Arboretum. We have done also the Opera House on the uh, left-hand side. Uh, you see here, uh, this is the IMAX Theater, who has a roof who moves. It's uh, an operable roof. And um, look at the relation between water and the building, and the fact of the reflection uh, of um, the building in the water. Maybe, maybe be, you see at the interior there is this sphere, who goes also in the underground, where the projections are done, and around it there is a kind of exhibition hall. Here you see a frontal uh, view of it. And here there is this big, it has 60 meter span, wall who is retractable. You see here also in the night, and you see it complete. I mean, virtually completed, because uh, this what happens under the water is the, uh, indeed uh, deliver us the completion of the overall idea of the building. So it was necessary in a way in this building to cap the reflection, to get the complete idea, which it is, in my opinion, a little bit different from the fact of just using the water for mirroring something, which you get just the duplicate symmetric. Here you need the water. Indeed, if you look the sphere inside, you see almost the sphere complete, uh, completed as it is really, because the half of the sphere is in the underground, where you go to see, uh, when you enter uh, to see the projection. You see it here also in a frontal view with the reflection, and here with the opening. So again, it is another, uh, another important step of this nature, you see, in which two, uh, two universes survive, uh, survive together. At the one side, the universe of the rigor of having to accommodate something uh, functionally uh, uh, so uh, particular, like it is an IMAX theater, by having a section, let's say, like this, and having here the, the half sphere, and this is the, the ground level. The people circulate in two levels, enter inside of the theater, sit 
uh, here and see the projections inside the sphere and then you get uh, uh, this kind of shell surrounding it with the big window. This is the level of the water. At the other side, you get here, you can see it from the exterior, and then there are uh, the two doors, and then there is this, uh, this retractable window who reflects in the water, who reflects, or by reflecting, reflects, of course, also the roof, and then you get the sphere uh, completed. So indeed, it is clear by seeing that, that maybe for you is also, you see, that the intention is uh, uh, to emphasize probably the most important organ to go in an IMAX theater, who is the eye, isn't it? And the view, and the vision. So it's uh, uh, in this, uh, again, uh, uh, you enter into a, a world of, uh, um, in which reality, let's say, uh, the reality, and uh, uh, the, here in this case, in the photo, if we can come back, you see in the photo you are seeing um, the reality and the virtuality, they appear melted together. You see, when you see this photo, you don't know if it is turned down. You know, it could be even turned down and the reality is down and, and, and the reflected image is in the top or whatever. So, and it's very interesting because it uh, uh, very much it emphasizes this, uh, this capacity that you have in architecture, not only to use the virtual image as part of a real world, like it could be like the dream world, you know, by dreaming when we sleep or, or whatever, you know, what happens in the night, you know. Nobody or very few people knows about it. It's so important. It exists. We, uh, indeed, our dream world is, is still there and it's part of our existence. One third of our life we spend by sleeping, you see. And even it is a tema who record, uh, recursive by artists, you know, by Rodin, by many people, you see, in which you see uh, uh, the approach to this invisible, let's say, invisible but real world, you see. Of, and, and so, uh, in architecture, you can also work with this kind of approaches, isn't it? And you can even use the, the, the reflected image, the virtual image, to show something who is real, who is behind, and you cannot see, but it is real because it exists. And at the other side, even to sublimate an image who is the image of seeing. And since uh, Alexander spoke about the classical uh, uh, architects and engineers, you see, I want to tell you why the eye, why the eye. Uh, so uh, I spoke about uh, uh, Matteo Marangoni, describing the world of the architect, saying that an architect similar to a sculptor or a painter, and this impressed me enormous, because for the first time, you see, after having been in schools in which, you know, the architecture is given in such a fragmentary way, somebody tell me an architect similar to a sculptor or a painter put the architecture at the level of the sculptures and the paintings. Something is something to be constatated. And the other thing I hear once, it is if Raphael, Raphael, the great painter, has not had arms, he could be such a good architect as he was. So you don't need your arms to be an architect. Do you understand? What do you need? You need the eyes. You need the, probably the eye of the mind. You see, there is a way to... to in, uh, the things I'm telling you appears before any brick is moved, any piece of concrete is put and not still is cut. So you have to live in this universum of, of uh, making things and building, let's say, uh, 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 virtual realities, you see, before those things are given using the guidance of the eyes of your mind and calibrating this which is coming out with the eyes of your face, isn't it? Because that the eye is so important, because that, you see, in my early phase as an architect, I was almost upset, you know, trying to understand it's true or it is not true, and then even emphasizing it uh, and using it as a metaphor. Here also another example of, uh, uh, that Alexander chose, has chosen uh, about a bridge. It's also an early uh, bridge. It's, uh, uh, I have done that in my 30s. You know, sometimes you have to cut the opportunity and building in Sevilla, you see the, the, civil, uh, the, the people of Sevilla, is a, who is a very beautiful city, uh, it's a very beautiful city, they have a concept, they call that, uh, they call it, uh, I will tell it also even in their language, la grandeza, who means the, 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 the greatness, the greatness. So the, the city is built, you know, in epochs, 
but always with a sense of greatness. You see it in many of the monuments and in the beauty of the city. So, it, it, you see, they were such a beautiful constellation, and it was also the opportunity to do something unique. Indeed, there was two bridges. You see, in the beginning, one of them paid by the central government was not built, but those paid by the region was built, thanks God. You see, so there was two twin bridges over the two uh, arms of the river. And you see here some images of it. It is particular because it's a, 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 almost a gravitatory bridge or an anti-gravitatory bridge because the, the, the pylon is balancing the weight of the deck. Uh, 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 and you see here also reflected in the water. Here also the pylon. He, the pedestrians in the center, I keep insisting always, you see, about this importance, that it is uh, enormous important in the bridges to think also on the accessibility uh, for pedestrians. And because they, uh, through the speed, they, they walk, uh, they can enjoy much more uh, uh, the whole uh, image of the bridge. What it happens here is the idea in the bridge, you see, the idea uh, emerge from uh, a certain research done uh, with... Uh, uh, with uh, a series of octahedra, put one over the other. Gravitating. and being tied by wires in order so those uh, those masses you see those weights who are uh, coming down, they get equilibrated by the tension of the ca cable and a resultant who is getting all the way through into the basis. And this generates the shape you see there as a bridge. Here is a little bit a different approach, isn't it? It's a more synthetic approach in which getting out of a composition based in the gravity, uh, call it the sculpture or, or whatever you want, you see uh, uh, the bridge. The bridge was, uh, let's say, the concept of the bridge, the, 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 the elementary concept of the bridge by uh, uh, compensating the weight of the platform, by the weight, uh, uh, compensating by, by the, the, the uh, inclination uh, and the position of the octahedra delivers you an statical system who is very similar, almost equal to this of the bridge. This is a, another project in a completely different context. Here, this is the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York. I was invited at the time to a competition to complete the cathedral. It was, as it happens, this kind of competitions that you do just because it's an interesting context. There was a, a very interesting people in the jury and the object was very interesting and it was also New York, so I participated many years ago in it. Uh, it was also interesting because was a preambula to the project of the Reichstag you saw before. Imagine doing this competition six or seven months before the project of the Reichstag. So the basic approach I have had here is very similar to this of the uh, uh, competition in Berlin I show you. Here there was the idea of using the roofs to do a garden, like the, uh, a garden of Eden, uh, up in the, uh, in the top of the cathedral, and you see here a cross-section in which I thought that with parabolic art I could recreate the uh, structure of the, of the uh, or have, uh, a little bit uh, like having a gothic approach, you see, as uh, uh, you could see yesterday in the, uh, some of the photographs that Alexander showed you, you see, in which I tried to do here a structure, however, auto-equilibrated by using inclined columns and having in the top uh, this kind of uh, bio-shelter was called at the time. Very much in order to involve environmental aspects into the, uh, or, the or, or an approach to nature in a secret, uh, secret manner. 
You see here the additional, because the major part of the cathedral it has been built, you see the roofs done in metal and glass, and then this uh, body coming out of the ruins of, or, or the uncompleted cathedral. Here you see also the overall uh, shape with uh, uh, very much in the, in the canons of the Gothic, isn't it? Because finally it's a neo-Gothic cathedral. I started more than 100 years ago and so my idea was not to, to uh, violate, if you want, the canonic understanding of the proportions of the Gothic, but just introduce a symbolical world, which it is the world of the, of the bio-shelter in the top of the cathedral that you can see by glazing the roofs in... in uh, uh, with glass and with a metal construction and then having this pie in the top of it. Here, uh, another example of uh, uh, a recent project. It is a museum, uh, is an addition of a museum in uh, Milwaukee. Indeed, uh, there, there was a museum, or uh, the war memorial was built by the architect Saarinen. Eliel and Ero conclude the work. Uh, uh, Starting as a war memorial became the place for the art collection of the uh, city. They has done an addition done by a local architect called David Keller, uh, and I was selected to do an, an, another addition in which uh, more the functional parts of the museum, like the reception hall, cafeteria, and temporary exhibition uh, parts should be done. You see here uh, the arrival from the bridge into the museum. You see here also the roof of uh, the museum and the cables, and here the structure uh, of the roof, who has a very particular uh, uh, um, uh, the capacity of by moving it open, as you can see here. You see it here, the structure open. Indeed, it was conceived in order that the opening happens around 12 hours, uh, along 12 hours uh, during the time and the, uh, the, the, the sun is turning around the the museum, so it was conceived as a so-called bris soleil. Um, however, it became a very strong uh, element or object of the identification of the museum. You see it here from the uh, main street, the Wisconsin Avenue. At the end, through the bridge, you arrive into the museum with an open roof. And here, also the long extension, the linear extension with the bridge at the end and uh, uh, the uh, roof. Here also a view in the night uh, with the gardens. Another um, aspect you see who are also rather important it is that we try to recreate the spaces of urban quality between the museum and the city who didn't exist before. So we consolidate the plaza, uh, ordinate also the, uh, the boulevard around it and, uh, and deliver, as I say, like a new plaza in this part of the city. Here you see a night view with a, uh, uh, basically we have used two materials, steel and concrete. And here a day view of this part of the roof. Indeed, here, uh, uh, as I say, is uh, one of the, um, mm, the use of the geometry and the order of the different parts uh, is maybe one of the patterns who permit hold together so heterogeneous elements as they are the roof, the movable roof, the mast of the bridge, and the bridge itself. Also here, another object of, uh, who precedes the, the museum in Milwaukee. Also built uh, um, again, as I say, many of my projects are in places, in very beautiful places, but uh, let's say uh, rather anonymous places. They are not, uh, uh, Milwaukee is not uh, the most important city in the United States, even if the people there uh, are for me or was for me the most important ones when I was working for them at least, because they were so kind and also they permit me to do this work. The same thing happens here. We are here in the Canary Islands and uh, we are being in Europe, but <laughs> almost uh, in, let's say, uh, in the middle of Africa, you could say, isn't it? So it's very interesting when a community of 170,000 inhabitants decide to do a, an opera house and uh, by having also not a very buoyant economy you see they need eight years you know to put together the 83 million dollars was necessary to build that to build the parking to build the plaza to make the opera to make all the installations even being a small one for 1700 uh, spectators and uh, you see here also built all in concrete among other things because no steel in the island so we have to use the local uh, resources and uh, you see here some of the views. There is, there is a big shell covering uh, the roof done in concrete. 
and also side shells uh, who define the atrium and this kind of central head is the opera building itself. It has been, as I say, done in uh, concrete and part of it, uh, this was uh, done in grey concrete covered with uh, small broken ceramic tails. You see it here also uh, in the perspective of the harbour and here with uh, the sea behind it. So when you look at the perspective of the city with the opera, you really believe these people like music. <laughs> Which is true, it's true. <laughs> they have also an excellent orchestra and a very, very wonderful festival. So maybe uh, I want to do just very rough two drawings uh, who may maybe link the two buildings before. Uh, indeed, in one of those, you see the last one, you see it has an important element uh, like uh, this. So, this idea of covering by using a shape uh, like that and using you see, has very much to do with Again, with the idea of rhythm, rhythm that you may maybe find, uh, let's say, in the in the vegetal world. Uh, uh, also. about the, the, the roof in Milwaukee. Even by getting out of, of very precise geometries, isn't it? It's not that uh, some of the geometries and the idea of movement merge also of the studies, in the case of Milwaukee, of the studies of, of the evolvement of the process of folding the cubus or the uh, 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 rhombodotecaedra I described yesterday by making the evolving of all the movement of it, uh, you uh, uh, reach uh, forms who are of this nature. You see, like I am drawing here with a wing in which you get into positions in which the, 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 the line who is in this position is changing and getting virtually into a vertical. And um, this is, if you want, a source, a theoretical source of an approach. But at the other side, the aspect of, of the roof suggests very much, you see, the idea of the fly and the idea of the open wings. So it's again another uh, uh, example of an approach by uh, having to deal, particularly here in the case of Tenerife, you see having to deal with important problems of uh, making a shell with 70 meter span by, by using uh, concrete and reinforcing the core with steel or the side shell, uh, but still, you know, preserving the, let's say, the freshness uh, and trying to preserve the freshness of the first approach or the first idea let's say, of the emotion of the first uh, moment. It is like, let's say, educating a child, you know. It takes uh, five minutes of joy and then you have to spend a big part of your life trying to rise him up into <laughs> something. <laughs> say that because I have four of them. So, I mean <laughs> so, uh, so it's... Uh, uh, <laughs> And uh, this is uh, uh, another, <laughs> another approach, you see, to, to, to another... Uh, I'd like um, to show you, I like that uh, this uh, slide has been uh, selected uh, by uh, Alexander because it permits me also to uh, speak about, uh, you see, what is another source of approach. Imagine, for example, you see, there was a time, as I say, you see, for example, constatating what is the rule of an architect or the rule, uh, or the rule of an architect in the art or what is architecture in art. Uh, uh, so I was thinking also very much in uh, elemental patterns, you see, like um, 
for example, you see the fact of the weight, you know, the, uh, see something, you see the things, I mean, I don't want to say like Newton, you know, who, who discovered like, but it, often, you know, at this very elementary, the weight of something, you know, you see that we live as we live in, 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 a, in a world of, uh, of light, we live also in a world of weight, of gravity. And uh, uh, so I started working with stone and uh, wires, you know, to create elementar uh, composition. Or, or, and one of them is, uh, let's say, a good question is why we stand up, why I can be standing in front of you and I don't, don't fall apart, you see, because I have a skeleton. But this skeleton works with a certain principle, mostly, you know, from, from in the torso uh, uh, related to the uh, vertical colon and um, to, to the vertebral colon. And so I started trying to do almost purely statical models of the vertebral colon by using stones and wires who will represent the ap apophysis of the vertebra and the way how the vertebra stands. Uh, so that indeed I will just, you see, uh, um, uh, imagine uh, a vertebra has this shape with the apophysis, so I, uh, I chose a cube of stone and then I put the apophysis supported uh, uh, by wires and then I use the muscles who are working here. You see I use them pulling here and one vertebra supported in the other by using two small co cones and recreating so the sense of, you see, the fact that our body is done by many of those vertebras coming down. and supporting the thorax and getting through the pelvis supported in the femur down into the... So, um, here particularly I describe not only the way how it works but also what happens if I turn around. You, you understand? So by twisting or turning, turning around an axis. So this was... Uh, done and it was a plastic like that. Years later, I was asked to do a skyscraper. I, they got, I got the opportunity to, uh, and then we grow uh, from a certain height of 60 meters into 200 meters, it was possible. The circumstances permit, you know, together with the client to develop this uh, skyscraper, who is done uh, almost literary. You see, I think almost exaggeratedly literary, a transgression from the pure sculpt sculptor who has nothing to do so far with architecture into a building by using a core, by placing inside the elevators. You, you can imagine the amount of functional belongings, escape stairs, installations, plant and uh, apartments and, and, and so, by uh, uh, getting oriented, as I uh, show you before, you see here one image and the other image. And here you see the building and the construction. Here you see the building finish. The experience uh, was uh, uh, very daring, isn't it? Because finally you can say was or was uh, is or it is not a good place to live. But you see there is a, 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 the client presented into a, a can, into the, there is a fera for the real estate and there was, uh, the building was chosen as the uh, best housing building of the year, you see. So apparently uh, uh, living there and, and, and the, let's say the approach uh, under a critical point of view, even under a commercial point of view, was, uh, uh, was not, uh, uh, not uh, 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 wrong, let's say. You see here also the building twisted in the area of the harbor of, of, of Malmö. Before, close to there, there was an enormous crane, the largest crane in the world that they removed because the harbor has changed very much and the area of the harbor is now most for a habitation and the building became in this area a kind of landmark uh, who uh, delivers identity and it is even visible from the other side from Denmark. You see here the, the spine turning around here in the night, here too. Yes, it's the this is the scale of the housing around and the building uh, rising up. 
Yeah. Well, uh, as you see, uh, we are, uh, um, through those examples, I hope uh, uh, to uh, feed in the thesis of uh, um, Alexandra, you see, of uh, combining two worlds completely different. One world is, uh, let's say, the world of the, call it the dreams, uh, uh, or the eight hours of sleep, or the seven hours, or sometimes even five. <laughs> you see, and, and, uh, and the rest is the world of the reality, dealing, uh, you see, with the, uh, 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 the needs and the uh, real reality of bringing these things uh, uh, to, a pass, uh, to, to feasibility. I mean, there is a lot of engineering behind it and also a lot of testing and a lot of wind cannot test and a lot of, uh, you see, uh, meetings and uh, even real difficulties and even a lot of organization behind. So you can move from the idea of a dream and put a lot of people, you know, it's a wonderful thing, you know, in very orthodox contexts as it could be in Sweden or in, in the Canary Islands or, or in Milwaukee, you see, uh, uh, put them all together behind uh, uh, the idea of a dream, you know, bringing something to a reality. And this is a piece, uh, that you can see is an assembling of uh, pieces of wood, is a study for a sculptor in which, again, the idea of floating plays an important role. It is like extending the arms and floating uh, 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 something over the head. Yes, I just would like to, uh, to do a, another uh, drawing who may even be, because, uh, as I understand, uh, you, see, you see the piece uh, looks uh, like this. See the piece looks like that. And this is a cable. You see, you uh, could imagine uh, this is a bit the idea of a child balancing something in the air. And uh, indeed, I think, uh, you see, in front of the, um, uh, uh, let's say, the, the problematic of, uh, of uh, getting confronted with very, as I, I insist, uh, very demanding problems who, for which you have to dedicate maybe three, four, five years of your life, you see, to make it possible in the beginning, again, very often they are ideas uh, uh, who has, uh, uh, let's say, the quality of uh, uh, a game, the quality of a dream, or the quality of uh, uh, a very spontaneous approach. And probably the most difficult uh, job, you know, from this moment on, is to cap the emotion, to cap the emotion during five years, you see, or more, you see, of this first moment, and reflect it not only in the overall shape, but also in the spontaneity of each one of the parts of the work. I think by now it becomes very clear that when we are talking about daydreaming and dream work, is very different from the everyday associations one has. It's a specific process, and it is an essential process, part of the overall creativity in design. What's also extremely interesting, as you know, Santiago was talking, is that it is also different from the way one hallucinates and has uh, fantasies, like if I might use a colleague's uh, uh, reference, once they asked Alvar Alto, what is your methodology? And Alto said, my beer bottle. So, of course, this is, this is true because beer makes you more relaxed. In other words, makes certain aspects of you know, controlling the matching between problem and possible solution more loose so you can jump to precedence and you can jump to preview solutions and through that analogically, anagogically find a solution to the current problem. But as you have seen, the matching between this vision from the non-conscious, from memories, 
And the solution is much more rigorous. I would argue there are two things here. First, you must have some kind of memory. And uh, not only a loose memory, but also systematic. We didn't bring it here, but it's a good case for you to go and uh, look at the books of Santiago, where you see the testimony of this patient work of accumulating precedence. And it's a very mysterious, I have no explanation about that, how a person, especially how a genius, goes collecting right and left precedents, depositing them either here or in real notebooks. Then comes the confrontation with the problem. And then comes this period that several times people call it incubation, or all kinds of more mystical uh, names for it. Poincaré describes it very beautifully. You know, it's almost between being, uh, you know, dreaming, deep dreaming, and uh, hallucinating, whereby, it's a beautiful picture. The rest, I believe, of the Poincaré description is a little bit misleading, actually. But he has a wonderful picture where previous mathematical objects are hanging on the wall. It's like your notebooks collecting all those previous images of people in postures, objects, leaves, and so on. And then he says there is a moment where they become loose from the wall. He has this picture. What actually he means is the matching, the search and matching process starts, and then all of a sudden you go to the president, in the case several times both of Santiago, but the other extreme of people in mathematics, you collect many precedents, they get out of the wall the same time and you recombine them, you, uh, if I might say, uh, decapitate them, you know, cut them apart, and bring them together into the new object. Now, throughout this process, cataloging, that acquiring, cataloging, Recalling, I believe, the analytical background is very important. Not so much in terms of classifying things, because if you classify everything, then, you know, you will never discover things. You will always going to be very banal, you know, repeating things which are known, as much as reducing them, abstracting them, and tagging them in quite an abstract way, so the matching and the catching from the wall and the recombination is possible. So what is really intoxicating is to see the real product itself, but to me even more fantastic is by looking at the project itself, start understanding this process of search, this process of going around till you match and you discover. What, in other words, people call invent a form which is unknown. So I would say that in the very end, and this is what I believe is a very, very valuable testimony to have it in the books, in the works, but also alive, is in relief the complementarity of the two sides, the analytical and the analogical, all 
joined in one process in the end, the process of creating the new. Before we come to today's conclusion, I would like to bring up a little bit the agenda of tomorrow. Okay, you have analysis. It's more or less like uh, bones, dry. You have analysis, an analogy, it is more loose, floating, it's like a flame, maybe. But in both cases, there is something very static. Especially as I kept on presenting your work, and I have to apologize up to today, not about tomorrow, emotion is lacking. You mentioned certain affective things, but more or less our discussion kept them out. So emotion, passion, all that is out. Moral issues have not been included. So, the very essence, not of the machine, but what draws the machine, either the analytical machine or the analogical machine, I believe was suppressed, somehow silent, for the first two days. I do hope tomorrow, not only we're going to bring those issues here, but with your collaboration, we will be able, and through a debate, to start digging even deeper into this fantastic, so human phenomenon, which is the phenomenon of creating the new. I think we should say Litarot for the moment, no? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Litarot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.